Okay. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, good afternoon from uh, New Delhi, India. My name is Noam Amas. I work for GIZ India. Um, and thank you so much for joining us today for our session for participatory water management for sustainable agriculture and aquaculture in Asia. Um, I uh, would very much like uh, if everyone could turn on their cameras to make this session a little bit more uh, lively. And um, I now hand over to our uh, session moderator, Mr. Srinivasan. Thank you, Nova. Let me formally welcome you all uh, for this uh, short panel discussion, uh, which will be followed by a presentation, uh, which will be preceded by a presentation on how um, participatory watersheds can be planned with the use of uh, technology with the wholesome benefits. Um, before we get into the session proper, um, the value of water, I think, is more intensely understood today with the kind of problem that we see in the US and large parts of Europe, uh, which was commonplace mostly in some parts of Asia and in Africa earlier. So I think uh, this week probably will become a few months in future so that we focus on how we manage our water resources. Um, to start off this session, um, I would uh, welcome Elizabeth Richter, the Deputy Head of Economic Cooperation and Development in the German Embassy uh, to give a few opening remarks um, and set the tone for uh, this session, which rightly is being political anchored by GIZ in large parts. Uh, Mrs. Rishta, over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And um, a warm welcome to everyone. On a very personal note, actually, I am from the uh, River Rhine region. That's where I grew up and uh, I was born. And seeing the pictures of the River Rhine um, at the moment is something that I think really shows the importance of water. So thank you so much for, um, for making the bridge uh, between uh, Germany and um, also other parts of the world. So that said, uh, a very warm welcome to everyone. Um, as you might have um, followed, uh, Prime Minister Modi and Chancellor Scholz have lifted our Indo-German cooperation on uh, 2nd of May to a new level um, through the signing of a partnership for green and sustainable development, um, which is a commitment by the German government and the Indian government in the next mm -hmm. 10 uh, years until 2030. And um, that said, um, our portfolio here in India actually is 90% um, climate relevant, uh, be it mitigation or adaptation. Um, so our cooperation, Indo-German cooperation in that regard is extremely strong and, um, and full of um, commitment. Um, and I think this high relevance of uh, climate mitigation and uh, adaptation is um, seen especially with the resource of water. Um, and those extreme heat waves, droughts, but also unforeseen rainfalls, floods, um, they, they are everywhere in the world. Like I said, region, I have seen there are uh, floodings as well. So um, it can destroy lives, but it can also destroy livelihoods of, of people. Um, so in that sense, um, I would like to to really welcome you um, and mention that um, with the Indian government, in particular in the field of agriculture, we are also working on a lighthouse initi uh, initiative on agroecology particularly, which, um, which um, is a bottom-up approach, um, which addresses agriculture and food systems in a more holistic way. Um, and this approach will trigger innovation and, and awareness uh, more amongst um, farmers in India also with respect to the resource of water, just as much as the resource of soil, that, um, that is another important aspect and it both goes to, together. Um, bringing up together all partners in the field of agroecology is important to us. And this also includes GIZ and NABAT, uh, as well as various government agencies on, on both sides. Um, so we intend to support South-South networks of exchange and mutual learning. Um, the project CSASA capacity enhancement for sustainable agriculture and sustainable agri uh, aquaculture 
um, through our technical cooperation to GIZ uh, with NABAT enables um, the implementation of a GIS-based planning approach and capacity enhancement of farmers' institutions, such as farmers' producers' organizations in the states of Telangana and Odisha, incorporating various aspects of natural farming and agroecology. And I'm sure that uh, many of you are more, um, are more firm with the project actually than uh, myself, but um, I'm really happy to hear also about the good impacts of this. Um, so um, it comes to the framework on story planning or farming. Um, through GSS, uh, Prasang is the name. This has been developed by CSASA in cooperation with non spatial data while taking into account agroecological principles. Um, furthermore, it allows and builds on the participation of the community. And this framework is very much in line with the objectives of the Lighthouse Initiative that we have for agroecology, which in itself is one of our contributions to our partnership with the Indian government for green and sustainable development. Um, that said, I'm really looking forward to your exchange today, and um, I'm happy to listen um, to what you have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Richter, for highlighting the uh, intensity of Indo-German cooperation around natural resource management, sustainable agriculture themes. Uh, in fact, when we, if we ever raise um, the term sustainable agriculture or um, natural resource management, you will always see an Indo-German development project with NABAD being the implementer. So we have Dr. Ravi Babu, general manager from NABAD. He is from the farm sector development department, which is the nodal department, which looks into all these aspects. In the past, uh, it was driving the umbrella program and natural resource management again with the GIZ and KFW cooperation. Uh, lately, they have spawned this JIVA project as well besides a number of other program, whether it's ProSoil, CSASA, all these projects are getting implemented through the Farm Sector Development Department. Now it's uh, my pleasure to invite Dr. Ravi Babu to give the keynote address on this occasion. Dr. Ravi Babu. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you very much. I'm very happy to see you in person. I mean, virtually, uh, I heard about, a lot about you. Uh, Ms. Elizabeth Richer from BMZ, uh, my co-host uh, uh, representing GIZ, Mr. Dr. Vaibhav Sarma, distinguished key panelists and eminent scholars in the field of water management. Where, whenever I see the conferences, I see the names of the eminent personalities the, whose names are given uh, in the list of key panelists. I'm very happy to see their names and I'm very happy to, uh, uh, to look forward to how the, the uh, presentations and discussions from them. Uh, uh, and uh, among others, I mean, we have Mr. Nova as also the professionals, participants and uh, custodians of water. Good afternoon and good morning, depending upon the places uh, from where you are all joining. On behalf of NABAT, I once again express uh, our happiness to associate in this global event of World Water Week organized under the leadership of Stockholm Water Institute. Uh, our co-host GIZ uh, came forward, uh, in fact, they came forward in uh, having a session that is online session on participatory water management for sustainable agriculture and aquaculture in India. Uh, the theme of this year conference, as you are, you are know, seeing the unseen, the value of water, this is highly relevant to India as also to NABAT. Uh, before uh, I proceed further, just let me introduce you, uh, introduce you about NABAT. NABAD is the Apex Bank for Agriculture and Rural Development established by an act of parliament. We are into multifarious uh, uh, functions, uh, starting from uh, providing concessional refinance to banks, infrastructure development, including uh, irrigation infrastructure development, supervision of cooperative banks and regional rural banks, policy advocacy, as also uh, the developmental initiatives. I'll just pick up from uh, where our Srinivasan have mentioned about uh, the journey of NABAD in NRMSPA. In addition to providing support for irrigation infrastructure development, we are uh, also supporting rain-fed farming. Uh, as you all know, in India, 50% of the area is under uh, rain-fed farming. Uh, though 50% of area, as per the statistics, is under irrigation, there are various problems in the irrigated uh, problems and challenges in the irrigated areas also. 
let me just make a mention of those problems uh, and the challenges which we are seeing in the projects. Uh, despite the development of irrigation, uh, uh, irrigated, net irrigated area of 70 million hectares, we are, we are uh, seeing the challenges in the field like uh, demand side management of water. A lot of emphasis has been given on the supply side, but uh, the demand side management of water, especially capacity building and uh, community participation uh, is the vital uh, gap which we are finding. Excessive seepage losses, wide gap in irrigation potential created and utilized, poor water productivity, poor irrigation efficiency, and poor maintenance of infrastructure created. These are the problems. In addition, the, uh, the fact that 60% of the, more than 60% of the net irrigated area, uh, the source uh, is mainly groundwater. Uh, the, uh, the groundwater levels are falling at an alarming rate. We are finding that nearly 20% of the groundwater assessment units have turned out, turned out to be overexploited. Uh, this is mainly an account of uh, misalignment of uh, the crops uh, in, in the given agroecological regions, among other regions. Um, uh, see, NABAD, uh, with the mission of promoting sustainable and equitable agriculture in the country, uh, is focusing both on uh, irrigated and rainfed areas. As uh, we have rainfed area of 50% of the cultivated area is under rainfed farming, uh, contributing to 40% of the production. Uh, we have been uh, into implementation of participatory watershed development projects, starting from, uh, as Srinivasan sir mentioned, uh, we, we started our journey with Indo-German watershed development program uh, way back in the year 1992, we started that program. Uh, now uh, we have our own fund, watershed development fund for the past uh, uh, 20 years, we have been uh, implementing uh, uh, the watershed development pro projects with the support of, uh, with, the, with the funds available with us. Uh, as so far, we have covered 3,500 watershed development projects covering 2.5 million hectares. The focus is on in-situ conservation of soil moisture. As we all know, when we receive 100 millimeter of rainfall, 50 to 60 percent uh, is retained on the soil, and uh, out of that 60 percent, 10 percent goes as evaporation. So far, the focus has been harvesting the runoff, which, which is around 20 to 25 percent. Now, uh, over a period of 20 years, we have realized the several uh, drawbacks in the implementation of watershed development program. We, we are now focusing on in-situ conservation of soil moisture. Though soil and water conservation measures are made, but what we found is that uh, uh, there, is, there is no so absorption capacity for the soils to retain high levels of moisture. As a result, most of it is lost. So the focus is on green water. Now, now we are focusing on adapting agroecological approaches uh, when we look back our uh, watershed development pro projects, which are highly successful with the participation of the community, with the residual value approach, participatory approaches, uh, we are finding that over a, after a gap of uh, five to 10 years of implementation of completion of the projects, uh, they are adapting monocropping and water intensive crops. And uh, the, as monocropping is there, external input orientation is there, ma margins are very less. So now uh, this year we came out with a new program that is Jiva. We are going to superimpose a layer of interventions in the completed watershed projects, mainly to diversify the crops, to go for multi-tier cropping with, uh, with, with having a cover crop uh, throughout the year. Even in the dry places also, we have seen with the rising of multiple crops integrated with the trees and livestock, we have, we have seen multiple benefits for the people. There are ecological benefits, there are economic benefits, as also enhanced the capacities of the people. So uh, the recent effort is uh, the introduction of uh, this uh, GIZ, uh, with the collaboration of GIZ, Capacity Enhancement and Sustainable Agriculture and Aquaculture uh, project has been grounded. Under this, whatever NRM projects have been supported by NABAR, they are mapped uh, using geospatial technologies. So far, conventional methods are used. Now, uh, we have been using remote sensing GIS for impact monitoring. Now we are using them for, uh, for planning purpose as well. With the support of GIZ, uh, we have mapped around 2,600 watersheds, nearly 500 tribal development projects. Thematic layers are prepared. Uh, now we are using those thematic layers in integrating and developing participatory plans. We are following top-down and bottom-up approaches. So without taking much time, uh, of course, uh, Dr. Vaibhav Sharma is there. He will be uh, highlighting the uh, features of uh, the CSAS, I mean, capacity enhancement for sustainable agriculture and aquaculture with uh, one case study. 
therefore without taking much time i i wish that the event will be a great uh, success and i look forward to have fruitful deliberations thank you very much for giving the opportunity thank you dr ravi babu that was very rich uh, the point that one realizes not one two of them you start with an experiment try and develop a model later on it gains uh, what do you call lot more confidence everywhere so what started as a grant project now nabard has institutionalized with its own watershed development funds or tribal development fund that's what you said the other point that struck me was uh, the german uh, india nabard collaboration on water is multi decades long just not weeks that's a very sharp meaning it takes time to involve community and then uh, bring them up, bring about changes which are behavioral not only just about use of water i think these two points are very well taken now it is uh, i think time to launch the knowledge product i now invite the giz and uh, nabard team to take the floor uh thank you thank you shrinivasan sir and uh, on behalf of uh, the indo german bilateral project uh, capacity announcement for sustainable agriculture and sustainable aquaculture uh, i would also uh, happy to share this uh, knowledge product which is uh, a framework of uh, the participatory planning approach uh, for watershed planning using gis and other innovative technologies which we have developed for one of the watersheds in telangana uh, which represents a uh, dry land area and rain fed uh, agriculture dominated uh, geography and this knowledge product uh, uh, in collaboration with nabard we are happy to share with the participants uh, uh, and uh, the panelists uh, for their inputs and suggestions and this uh, knowledge product will be available in the file section of the session and uh, further uh, based on the inputs uh, and the suggestions which you receive on the knowledge product we are going to further update uh, this framework and also there will be an article Uh, which we are planning to publish as an output of this session so this would be the uh, us brief summary about this knowledge product and uh, in my presentation next 10 12 minutes i'll be taking a deep dive into the technicalities and what sort of technologies we have used what benefit does this uh, framework bring in yeah th thank you dr vibha sharma i think now it is time to introduce you so that you get ahead with your presentation to the audience um, dr sharma is a technical advisor to giz um, before that uh, he has seen the entire spectrum of activities in natural resource management and uh, climate related uh, what do you call studies um, whether it is bioinformatics or whether it is gis based uh, framework or even i think climate risk assessments and climate risk framework so he comes with a wealth of experience he is a veteran in the sector um, so it would be nice to hear from you as to what gi z and nabard are doing together and how uh, the c sasa and other projects are ongoing forward thank you thank you uh, shrinivasan sir uh, uh, for the brief introduction and uh, it's my pleasure to present uh, this uh, case study Uh, formally to the to the this august gathering of the senior panelists uh, and uh, the experts who are connecting with us uh, from different parts of the globe and uh, also thanks to the stockholm world water institute uh, for providing us this platform uh, in the form of an opportunity to share the learnings for, as part of indo german collaboration uh, from india from a asia perspective uh, to the different part of globe and also to promote the peer exchange the capacity enhancement for sustainable agriculture and sustainable aquaculture project uh, is a project supported by german federal ministry for economic cooperation and development uh, to support nabard uh, in terms of enhancing the digitalization uh, and the other innovative technologies for promoting the sustainable agriculture and aquaculture in the natural resource management portfolio of nabard in the form of watershed development fund and tribal development fund and similar schemes the another important output is to focus on the forward linkages i mean once these uh, watersheds are uh, 
promoted in terms of soil and water conservation, the agriculture outputs and the yield and the produce, how that can be linked up with the, uh, with the, with the market through strengthening of the FPO ecosystem. So these are the two important components uh, of the CISASA project. And currently this project is being implemented in the Odisha, which is a coastal state in India, uh, in, the, in the Southeast zone uh, of the country and Telangana in the Deccan Plateau region. So both of the topographies represent unique uh, settings and a sort of laboratory setting, I must say, in a very challenging manner to test uh, the, the innovations which are happening in this project and uh, provide enough opportunities in terms of agroecological alignment to further scale it up in entire country. Next slide. So this, uh, uh, our, the main topic of this presentation is the Prasang framework, uh, which represent a participatory framework uh, using GIS technology, how a watershed plan can be uh, develop and major focus remains on the digitalization because it brings a lot of transparency and uh, inclusiveness into the system. The framework is based on the characterization of landscape, assessment of the local availability of natural resources, opportunities and the challenges in a very systematic and a scientific logic using the state and national level freely available data. So our main focus is on bring the scientific logic while not make uh, it very co cumbersome and uh, to make it comprehensive, but at the same time, easy to understand by the local community so that they can uh, wholeheartedly uh, communicate through this framework and uh, as, you know, uh, include their aspirations in terms of NRM, local natural resource management system and the other production system through the watershed plan. The important another pillar is the decentralized and the uh, and very uh, federal uh, process. So these plans are created by local implementation agencies, which are generally CSOs or, or NGOs, which work very closely with the local communities. And uh, these plans are developed and have been developed uh, based on the community aspirations while sitting with the community in different uh, through village level committees uh, and having stakeholder consultations as well. The overall idea of this framework is not only to enhance water or soil, but to see the watershed in the lens of the, in the form of a production system, how the opportunity and challenges can be harmonized uh, to have a agroecologically uh, sustainable uh, uh, system, which benefits the local farming community in terms of agriculture yield, enhancing the livelihood, but at the same time, promoting the recycle, recycle reuse and or in in the other term, circular economy. The framework which are developed uh, as part of this process are well aligned with the, with the NAVARD guidelines uh, and are also aligned with the other state and national level program, which provide us uh, good opportunities of convergence and co-financing. Next slide. So uh, we, uh, when we, this is a subject started, uh, when, we, when we were envisaging this framework, uh, we, we had a stakeholder consultation at all level from head office to regional offices and also with the implementation agency and also com uh, the communities. And we found that there are several pain points which are need to be addressed. So a framework is required to be holistic understanding. It should pro provide the watershed level or landscape level overview of the uh, geophysical setting so that uh, hydrologically and scientifically plan can be made. It should be time efficient. Uh, uh, so that, uh, I mean, now earlier, I mean, we have experienced that uh, the conventional way, six months to eight months or sometimes more, uh, I mean, plans generally take time to prepare a plan on field. But now with this approach, uh, we have successfully developed plan within five to seven days, which are further validated on ground. And uh, we found really good accuracy, uh, almost up to 95%. And further, the, the framework is in a manner that it is so agile that more uh, community aspirations can be further included. It saves a lot of money for the implementation agency because every data set which we use, it is already available in the national and state data portals in the form of national remote sensing center or state uh, remote sensing center. So no data need to be purchased and it reduces a lot of drudgery and technical drudgery of the, of the, of the loc uh, local NGOs and a plan can be made simply almost uh, without any surplus cost. The plans are in the form of KMLs, or you can say a digital maps, and uh, they, they further provide uh, a standardized approach 
for co-financing opportunity with the other line departments and also national uh, and state level programs, but also the international programs like World Bank or ADB sponsored programs. So same uh, map uh, or perspective plans can be shared in the in the form of a steering committee where convergence and uh, co-financing can happen for the betterment of overall watershed. Next slide. So these are the, you know, we follow a five step approach. So first is the, uh, the, the local NGOs, the implementation agencies are, uh, capacity, their capacities are built uh, on the on the framework. Then our watershed plan is prepared using the spatial data that is the GIS uh, layers like land use, forest cover, drainage pattern, linear mines, etc. Then further, the the GIS based plan is further strengthened with the help of uh, water budgeting uh, in the form of alpha numeric uh, data set templates, uh, so that we know clear cut impacts that in case of the futuristic projections, upcoming climate uh, scenarios, what would be the impact of these structures or interventions in terms of supply side and demand side, and what would be the overall water, water budget. Then a plan has plan is prepared and further it is shared with the community and uh, their comments and suggestions are included and further then the plans is plans, plan is consolidated and shared with NABARD for further processing and uh, allocation of the budget. And this entire process, I mean, in the, in the case study of Chennai Lakshmipur, uh, we have really, uh, we have completed in a very fast track mode. Uh, within a week, the plan was prepared, it was ground validated. And then, I mean, while we are talking within a couple of months, it is already uh, being in the, in the almost in the, in the, at the level of budget allocation. So uh, this actually helped uh, not only the communities, the local NGOs, and also NABA to facilitate this process in a very time bound manner. Next slide. So these are some of the layers which are already available from National Remote Sensing Center uh, in the Bhuvan portal, freely available, and how to download this data and use. And these data sets are available at country scale. So one case study which comes from Telangana can be easily replicated from uh, anywhere in the entire country. And it, it gives us really uh, super quality data of land use, land cover, geomorphology, cadastral map, the village map, how the soil depth looks like, the slope, the soil texture, micro watershed, and the linear mend and drainage pattern. So these are the characteristics which were generally lacking and uh, people and the local NGOs were relying on the, on the ad hoc arrangement of topo sheets and other similar uh, non-digitized manner. But now through this framework, uh, the entire digital data set is available free of cost. And uh, the other good part of that, this framework is that the NRSC keeps updating these on time bound manner. So the framework will never, uh, go uh, sort of, uh, you know, quite old or data sets are always refreshed periodically. Next slide. As I was saying that we also have a set of non-spatial data sets. So if you see here, we focus on water budgeting that what in the form of intervention, what would be the impact? The idea of crop planning is there that what would be the demand side management, what sort of crop should, how crop should be, uh, appropriate crop should be planned, uh, land resource information in terms of soil quality, available runoff, land cover, et cetera, are also taken care of, socioeconomic characteristics, which are important to understand the, uh, the, the aspirational aspect from the community is important, and climate data, past and future, we both are referring uh, to, to, to further strengthen this framework. Lastly, I think FPI forgot, I mean, once we have this clear cut idea of the perspective potentiality of this watershed plan, the output would be in the form of the uh, an estimate of yield, uh, which is further linked with the farmer producer organization and market linkages. Next slide. So these are uh, some postulates of uh, how it is done on ground. We follow ridge to valley approach, which is generic watershed approach, universal watershed approach, and upper reaches are treated first with structure like uh, loose border check dams, CCTs, etc. This is followed by middle level uh, structures, lower reaches, and the farm pond, and also the focus remains on the recycle reuse of the gray water in the plain areas and command area treatments. So entire ridge to valley approach is followed, and uh, complete saturation of watershed is generally uh, perceived. Uh, and lastly, we, not only on the watershed side, but uh, from the community perspective, we include uh, market linkage livelihood, uh, the specific uh, you know uh, demands from the from the uh, livestock rearer or agriculture or crop uh, farmers or the on the and they also uh, the key focus remain on the inclusive, on the how we could include the the 
uh, requirements from the from the women farmer or the smallholder farmer. So those sort of softer aspects, but which make really divisive, decisive uh, instrumentation in any watershed plan are also taken care of. Next slide. So this, these are some of the, again, pictures of the planning process. Mm. Next slide, Noah. So this is a perspective plan in a in a 2D manner. Uh, because of the lack of time and technological restriction, I couldn't be able to showcase you this plan in a 3D manner on Google Earth. So platform, we generally prefer to understand the topographies Google Earth along with the other freely available data sets. And currently, I mean, it is a 2D aspect which you can see uh, from the north, it is on the higher uh, higher elevated areas and in the yellow patches, the are the agriculture land. And, and all the entire watershed area has been saturated with the with the uh, different sort of activities. Can you can we go to next slide? Uh, this is sort of uh, a 3D aspect which showcase the detailed uh, description of the watershed plan in the upper slopes. 83 works have been proposed in consultation with community in the middle slopes, 501 in gentle slopes, 32 works, and plain areas, 441 works. And also in terms, uh, in conjunction with the NRM activities, natural resource management activity, non-NRM activities were also proposed in consultation with the community uh, using GIS and remote sensing data set that how, which are the appropriate site for fodder cultivation, demonstration of pulses crops or multi-croppings, where, uh, what sort of uh, appropriate sites we should be promoting for drip irrigation, fishery, biocontrol agents, and agro-horticulture, et cetera. In total, there are almost 1,400 activities proposed uh, worth almost 200,000 euros of budget through this plan. Next slide. So th uh, this is a, a clear cut case of the uh, water budgeting, which we use uh, before we finalize this plan. And already there was a uh, deficit of 82.9 hectare meter. And can we go to next slide? Uh, to, it, through this plan, we have almost uh, promote, uh, included or you can say enhance the water uh, storage capacity of uh, for almost like 40 hectare, which amounts to almost uh, 40, 32 to 40 percent of the uh, you know surplus will be there. I mean, once the uh, structures will be created, and another, I mean, uh, 40 to 50 percent can be managed through the demand side management because only supply side management cannot handle. So in totality, uh, so the the the, the the framework allows you not only to see the watershed through GIS from a, from a spatial angle, but also allows one to assess uh, uh, the watershed challenges and opportunities in terms of clear cut uh, hardcore numbers, what would be the impact. Also, as you can see, uh, while uh, creating the, or in, in case of implementation of this perspective plan, 250 hectare of potential area will be treated in terms of plantation and enhancing the local uh, bioecological system. And uh, this will further uh, prohibit the soil erosion and uh, enhance the local soil moisture settings. Uh, through the uh, promotion of uh, water bodies and uh, new ponds, uh, there is a potential of fish production in the watershed up to 100 ton per year, which further enhance the income for uh, almost 200 uh, households in the watershed through the new livelihood opportunities which will come through when this plan will be. Uh, implemented. At the end of the day, as, as we envisage through our agroecological uh, principles and also in light with the, uh, uh, the lighthouse of uh, agroecology being promoted by GIZ or an Indo-German corporation, our main focus is to increase or enhance the living income of the local communities. And I think this framework not only enhances the soil and water uh, capacities of the watershed, but at the end of the day, it uh, proposed the uh, living income of the local communities. Next slide. Uh, with these words, I would uh, stop my presentation here, and uh, I would be happy to receive comments, uh, suggestions, and input from the participants uh, uh, on, the, on the framework uh, later on. And uh, Mr. Rajiv Ehal, Director, NRM AE, GIZ India can be contacted, or otherwise my email ID is on the screen. Uh, I would be happy to receive uh, more communication on this. Thank you. Thank you uh, to all. Srinivasan, uh, sir, back to you. Thank you, Aibal, for that, uh, uh, what you call short, but reasonably elaborate kind of a presentation on what exactly is getting done uh, under this, and also the 
uh, the planning process, which is participatory, but also brings in technological inputs, as it was not, say, about uh, 10 years back or so in uh, watershed uh, planning. I think it was quite exciting to hear. And I'm sure that there will be more questions coming from the audience offline, maybe through your mail ID and all that. Um, now we uh, turn to uh, an exciting panel discussion. Uh, this is a panel that uh, one would uh, try very hard to put together uh, a person who is a technical expert, uh, a person who is a development economic expert, and a person who is fully engaged in policy analysis and policy advocacy of different kinds. So it's my pleasure to introduce the panel before we get ahead with the discussions. Um, Dr. Petra Schmitter, she is a principal researcher with the International Water Management Institute. Uh, she has been focusing on uh, water management solutions for agriculture, especially the small farmer led solutions on how to manage water, whether it is from mainstream irrigation systems or uh, it is uh, rain fed kind of uh, systems. So she has done this work across the world, it looks like she has a world map barring Latin America in her, what do you call, profile there, Belgium, uh, to begin with then in Africa, say Ethiopia, Ghana, Tanzania, um, Benin, then in Southeast Asia, Myanmar, Singapore, uh, Thailand, Vietnam, um, extensive amount of work. And it's not as if this all only on water. There are 35 peer-reviewed articles appearing in journals. So there is something physical you could see in terms of what uh, Dr. Petra had done. Then we turn to Dr. Meher Shah. Um, he was the youngest planning commission member. I hope uh, Dr. Shah remembers that. Uh, appointed at that time, I think in 2008, 2009, around that time, I remember when he joined up. Um, he had done... Uh, so much of work uh, on the, what do you call, development side of the country. So anyone who is in the development sphere, whether it's rural development, whether it's agriculture, whether it's relating to water, but he has focused so much on water related works. That's where quite a lot of people have taken uh, inspiration from his work, guidance and wisdom from his work on doing what they do. Um, and uh, he's one of the persons who did quite a bit of work on restructuring the um, the National Rural Employment Guarantee Program that is fully operational across the country for several years, very successfully. Um, and uh, yeah, in the 12th five-year plan, he also uh, created a huge, what do you call it, a paradigm shift, as they described, in how water resources are managed in the country. So welcome to the panel, Dr. Shah. Mm -hmm. Then uh, I would like to welcome uh, Professor Sachin uh, Chaturvedi who is the Director General at the Research Information research and Information System for Developing Countries. Uh, he is handling fairly large networks. Uh, he is also the Vice Chair um, of the Institute of Good Governance and uh, Policy Analysis. And again, uh, he is a prolific writer, having written more than 22 books. And he is credited with creating the uh, network for the South to South collaboration called NEST how uh, these uh, people could actually get together to pool information and then exchange. So uh, it's a very good mix of uh, expertise in our panel. My job is to only ask the questions and then sit back. Uh, what I have in mind is I, I have an opening question for uh, each of you. And uh, maybe you take about three to four minutes in uh, what you call looking through uh, what uh, that entails for the audience. Then we have a follow-up question where we might spend about five minutes each. And eventually, if we have some time left, we spend about a minute each towards the end, uh, looking at the future and what kind of priorities. So Dr. Petra, um, I start with you. Um, meaning you have been, uh, what do you call, operating across the world and uh, you have been so thoroughly involved in uh, participatory approaches on watershed management. Vaibhav was talking about uh, how the GIS data is brought in, the spatial data is brought into planning. Given that communities are what they are, with their level of literacy, uh, familiarity with, and also ease of use with technology, uh, how do you see uh, participatory water management approaches on this kind of a framework? Is it scalable uh, in, in the, and how much space it has in South-South cooperation? 
Thank you very much. It's a oh, it's a complicated question. Uh, first of all, I want to congratulate actually the presenter. I think it was a great presentation, very comprehensive, and really shows the true potential. Um, I see. If I look back at, at a lot of the interventions we have done in the past, there is definitely a scope of bringing in some of that, you know, GIS, remote sensing based tools and solutions. Um, yes, I know that we often say, oh, communities, you know, literacy is an issue, but you would be surprised if you if you manage to have the right um, translation of the information and if you you have the right uh, points right on the map being at a school, being at something that really hits home very easily, they can orientate themselves very, very well. Uh, and then you kind of start a discussion from there, right? And then it makes the whole translation of the complex GIS technical analysis into, you know, readily applicable uh, discussions much easier. Um, so I think going forward, I see a lot of scope. Um, I think it's really crucial, though, to ensure that the translation is done, um, that we do the analysis actually hand in hand with, with social scientists, so scientists that are actually really coming from a communal perspective, um, so that the translation, yeah, so that the solutions don't get lost in translation. Let me say it like that. Um, I think in terms of scaling, um, I think there are two, two things to keep in mind. Um, I think, first of all, yeah, we talked about the watershed. Now, watersheds can have different sizes, and therefore you can have communities, you know, being aggregated over different sizes. So I think we need to think, for, I mean, going forward, I think we need to think about this nested approach, yeah, the scales within the scales or the watersheds within the scales. And, and how does that work, right? How do we actually avoid maybe community conflicts between different communities within the same watershed. So yes, we have now looked at communities within a watershed, but then how do we look at multiple communities, multiple watersheds in a nested way? I think it's the next question. And, and my last point there is that, of course, whilst participatory management is by, for, and with the communities, there are other actors you know, that we start need to think of. Um, think about uh, private sector companies, you know, that exploit water resources for other purposes, et cetera, et cetera. We need to bring them into the conversation as well, because they also are water users, right? And they also will have a role to play. So I think thinking through in the future also, how do you bring other actors alongside communities, again, to make sure that, you know, the, the most vulnerable, the communities stay in charge and, and, and stay oh, yeah, keep the ownership. I think that will be crucial going forward. Let me stop here and I'm happy to further discuss later on. Thank you, um, Dr. Shah. I, it, it practically the same question, but I'm not going to ask you about the technical piece. Um, meaning, we the approach uh, from which we have learned most in the country is micro watersheds, not the large ones, and uh, participation becomes much easier there. But given the complexities in having a large number of micro watersheds and then trying to build in participation, uh, what do you think about replicability and scalability? And uh, how much we know that well, that in South-South cooperation, this can actually play a role. Right. I think um, replicability is the key question. And thank you for asking that question, because, uh, you know, we have a lot of examples of what I call oases of excellence. So you have one watershed here, one watershed there, and, you know, even water management projects. Uh, the real challenge, anyone who wants to make a big impact is how to scale. And for scale, we do require the criterion of replicability. Now, what happens here is, you know, Petra is here and IVMI did a very large study on participatory irrigation management some years ago. And, you know, what uh, you would find there is that PIM actually failed more often than it succeeded. So what happens is people think, therefore, participatory approaches will not work. I mean, a lot of, I'm sorry to say, but uh, people who are not very much in favor of changing the paradigm towards a participatory approach immediately jumped on that study and said, look, PIM has failed. Now, my take on it was very different. And in the 12th five-year plan, what we did, therefore, is to actually initiate a very deep diagnostics of failure and also a very careful analysis of success because there are successes and there are failures. And I think the important criterion for replicability is if we draw the right lessons from both the failures and the successes. 
So what we found is we found actually 10 conditions under which only under which these participatory approaches would work. And I just take you back to, you know, the mother of all uh, this work, so to speak, Eleanor Ostrom, who, you know, won the Nobel Prize being a political scientist, she won the Nobel Prize in economics for, uh, you know, her book, Governing the Commons. And it's essentially the exercise she had done. What are the conditions under which it becomes possible to successfully manage a common pool resource? And we find many, many important conclusions that come out. When we take groundwater management, for example, India has launched, you know, when I was in the planning commission, we launched the National Aquifer uh, Management Program. And now we have the Atal Bhujal Yojana, which is probably the only program of its kind at its scale in the world, where we are trying to promote participatory groundwater management. But that requires that the primary stakeholders of water are carefully informed about, and as Petra was saying, in the language which they will be able to connect with. And they will definitely be able to connect with it. As Petra was saying, there's no question about it. It's actually our failure that we don't communicate it in the language which they would be able to access. And so if we do that, and if they have a clear understanding of the limitations or the possibilities of the particular aquifer, which they are trying to collectively manage, then the requisite changes in cropping patterns can be brought about. So an informed decision is very important. A anything that promotes the uh, formation of powerful collectives of farmers in this case is extremely important, how empowered they are. As far as the participatory irrigation management, which I mentioned earlier, what matters is whether the water users associations have the power to retain the irrigation service fees that they charge the farmers who they provide the water. If they can uh, you know, retain that and not have to necessarily hand it over to the irrigation department, then they can manage, they can uh, operate, operate the systems properly, maintain them properly. And you would you know, be happy, I'm sure all of you are aware, but this is another one of the factors which we forget that people are willing to pay. They are able and willing to pay for the irrigation that they get so long as there is quality of service. So if they are empowered, they are in a setup where they can manage the systems on their own, then the essential problem, which Dr. Rao mentioned in his initial presentation of the gap between the irrigated area, uh, you know, the potential created and the potential utilized, you know, we have 24 million hectares of land in India, which we can quickly add to irrigated area if only we were to empower the water users associations in the manner in which, you know, of course, it's more details uh, are there, but I'm just mentioning some of the key factors. So I think replicability, therefore, to come back to, you know, your main question is, it depends on our being able to create the conditions for successful replication. And then there is no problem in carrying this, uh, you know, very important initiative to scale. Thank you, Dr. Shah. I think uh, that that's a resounding yes. And then, yeah, let us prepare ourselves better in order that we communicate in the correct idiom and language. Okay. Um, Professor Chaturvedi, now I turn to you. We slightly turned the question to, uh, meaning when it is a supply driven um, kind of uh, irrigation system you bring in, it is much easier. You know what are the investment costs. You can put it and go out. Uh, we do not know how much a stabilized participatory water management system will cost because we do not know how much time it will take, depending on the local community, their acceptance, willingness to take ownership, maintain, and willingness to pass ownership and all that. So what might be the economic reason uh, for, uh, let us say, yeah, a participatory watershed management should be a better preferred approach for us to follow. Uh, thanks, uh, uh, thanks, Dr. Shivas. And I think uh, my, uh, two arguments are are absolutely clear. And I am uh, glad that uh, uh, Dr. Mahisha has uh, uh, re-emphasized the point uh, on which the whole policy ecosystem has evolved. Uh, the emphasis in terms of uh, uh, participatory approach, uh, which we have uh, witnessed, uh, is coming in from uh, both the traction that uh, uh, um, uh, uh, people's participation bring in in terms of responsible usage, uh, but also in terms of uh, sense of ownership. And that I think uh, both are, are extremely important. The other day, uh, 
uh, with uh, uh, Dr. Mihir Shah, I was discussing uh, uh, the writings of uh, uh, Rabindranath Tagore uh, back in uh, 1915 uh, when he criticized uh, the uh, government, uh, the British government at that point, their decision to supply water uh, through uh, uh, the uh, pipelines that they were laying out in Kolkata at that point uh, 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 with the intervention of the Kolkata Municipal Corporation. And he criticized precisely for two reasons. One, the sense of ownership would go away from the local water bodies. And the second, the value of water. And that's precisely, Dr. Srinivasan, we are trying to bring back uh, with the larger global intervention, with India's forthcoming uh, uh, G20 presidency, we are trying to take this point forward in terms of how uh, uh, we bring back local ownership. How do we bring back local sensitivity, participation? There is a study which uh, uh, the OECD and, uh, and uh, uh, the World Water Council, uh, they have come, come up with. And this very clearly shows uh, uh, $22.6 trillion you would require if at all we have to accomplish goal uh, six, SDG goal six by 2050. And, and this is a huge dimension which Saudi Arabia in their presidency has laid out. The uh, Indonesian presidency again has emphasized and India is also very likely to take this forward. The other dimension is largely in terms of identifying uh, what kind of uh, 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 a sort of decadal review which we are planning between uh, 2018 and 2028, which is for uh, water for sustainable development. So these issues, uh, Dr. Srinivasan, are equally important at the global level. How do we do the course correction? And I'm so glad GIZ is bringing forward the strategies that are at the, at the local level, but BMZ has supported it at the global level during the German presidency of G20 in 2017. German government was the one which actually introduced the review uh, phenomenon uh, that came in uh, with Water for Life, the, the program that the UN was running. So I think it is important for us to be conscientious of the fact that the global uh, funding agencies, global uh, institutions, which are uh, providing resources for local uh, uh, initiatives are in tandem with the local experiences that are coming back. And, and, and for that reason, we need to collate some of these experiences from the local uh, strategies. And, and in this uh, 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 excellent presentation uh, uh, that we had with the uh, web of Sharma just now, I think it is important for us to see what lessons we take out from here and project as part of India's strategy uh, for the G20. And, and, and that's where uh, the larger connects are coming in. Fortunately, my own institute is the knowledge partner uh, with the uh, with Ministry of Agriculture. And we are providing the issues that are there in terms of best practices portfolio. And I would be very, very keen to learn both uh, as, as part of the water strategy, but also Dr. Srinivasan as part of the digital agriculture. The uh, whole uh, prasang that has just been presented to us is absolutely fascinating in terms of how digital uh, options are part of the policy process right down on the, on the projects. So some of these experiences are extremely interesting and I think they should be taken forward. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Chaturvedi. I think um, you are also reflecting mostly what um, which I had said earlier. Look, they should have a ownership in both the problems and solutions relating to water management make people appreciate what is the value of water, not in rupee or what, those terms. There is something there that you should actually preserve, conserve, use it optimally. I think then all other superstructures come on that. Um, Dr. Petra, I now turn to you to with, with another question. You have done work right across several countries and uh, there must have been some differences in the water management framework that have been designed. Like you said, right in the original presentation, first, meaning different communities, different contexts. When you look, uh, look back through all of them, 
what are those features in those frameworks that become relevant let us see whether the list that you produce match with the 10 conditions that uh, dr shah talked about Can you unmute? Oh, I your... was muted yeah. there, yeah. Yes, 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 <laughs> Sorry yes, for yes. that. Yeah. No, I think there are a lot of similarities with what Dr. Shah already mentioned, no? Starting with ownership and how to create ownership. Definitely, that was across, that's across the globe, I think. Uh, definitely a key for success. Um, the second is about understanding, and we talked about value of water, but to really narrow down on what that value means. And a value, let's put a value against water means different things for different people, even within the same community, right? So you have it within the community, across the communities, etc. And understanding that and translating that, I think, is a second very important one. Uh, the third one, I think, is, and this is where I'm, I'm actually still trying to think through, how do we collate and connect all the different micro watershed participatory management um, experience that we gain across these countries? Because Dr. Shah talked about participatory irrigation management, and there are a lot of similarities no, with participatory water management. But I still feel that we, we haven't yet collated you know, that, that learnings, those learnings on the watershed level. Um, GIZ has done a lot, but yeah, you also mentioned you know, investment banks like the World Bank, ADB are interested in it. They're talking about micro watersheds as they roll out. How can we capture actually all of those lessons, um, given that a lot of agencies, institutions, both on a local, national, and, and regional or global level are actually participating and, and really wanting to invest in it. How can we bring that together, right? How can we avoid duplication and rather kind of extend or strengths across, across those um, different regions? I think that is going to be really, really key. Um, and then my, my last point, I think, is, is yeah, I'm, I'm coming back to it because we keep on focusing on the communities, uh, which for me still is key. Everything hinges upon it. But how do we still connect it to the wider political economy? Because at the end of the day, it is going to influence not only the value that the communities put against water and against their practices, but it's also going to incentivize them, right? Or disincentivize them if it's not aligned. And and I think there we kind of still miss the link. I think it's really important to not just look at the communities, but look at the wider political economy. And that goes anything from political instability and, you know, export disruptions to, you know, more complex situations. So I think that's really important. And then, of course, you know, the obvious linkages with, with climate change and other shocks to the systems that we all have experiencing no, over the past years. And I think, yeah, let, let me leave it by that. And then I'm happy to yeah, yeah. further interact. Yeah, thank you. I think um, um, the, the uh, aspect that you referred to the how to link this to the greater political economy is where we are going to Dr. Shah now. Um, there are a number I of things. That are, yes, yes. There are a number of things we have done in the past. Um, uh, as a policy initiative in relation to water, um, we had certain regimes like how close the wells could be sited in dark zones and then about pricing, usage, exploitation. Uh, what more needs to be done? What kind of specific policy initiatives might be now required to ensure that uh, water management becomes a pupil-led exercise and uh, yeah, what we call the social capital in very loose terms uh, that remains invested in that by the people. Right. I think I'll take up what Professor Chaturvedi was saying earlier also and what Dr. Petra was just mentioning. <clears throat> Sometimes I say, what does he know of water who only water knows? Right. I mean, that is the whole point which Petra was just making. All decisions that are being taken by communities or at a micro level by farmers are governed by a political economy framework. If you take the case of India, 90% of our water is going to agriculture. And within agriculture, as you know, all of you know very well, is just three crops, wheat, rice, and sugarcane that take up 80% of our irrigation. And what is driving that? It's the policy framework. If the procurement policies of the government, even today, remain overwhelmingly focused on wheat and rice, you know, even with a little bit of diversification that has happened in Orissa with the Orissa Millets Mission, a little bit in Karnataka in other states, it's still 95% of our procurement is of wheat and rice. So we are creating, exactly as Petra says, we are creating an incentive for over-exploitation of water. What will the poor community do? 
how how can you put the onus of making the paradigm shift in water uh, be placed on the community it is fundamentally a question of the overwhelming policy framework which is driving water use in india so unless we introduce we diversify the basket of procurement and my suggestion is and you know professor chaturvedi wears many hats dr shimas yes. and i don't know if you are aware of the he has too many hats I like i do sort of like me i mean some of us i think we some hat should be taken off but i am very happy that he is also the vice chair of the planning commission in madhya pradesh and what i am trying to do is to work closely with him because it's the states who have to drive the reform in water sector finally if we can introduce these nutri cereals pulses and oil seeds you know the crops which are aligned with agroecology what dr rao said in his keynote address yeah without that you cannot solve the farming problem in india without that you cannot solve the water problem in india what we need to do is if we can procure those in a decentralized manner and make them available in the nutrition programs you know india runs the largest nutrition programs for children adolescent girls pregnant lactating women in the world so the mid day meal program the icds program mm -hmm. if we can actually alter the menu and luckily the menu is not decided either by the national planning commission or the state planning commission it is decided by the local district administration so we can actually have very diversified menu and then we create a humongous demand because normally when i say we should procure these uh, grains people say what will you do with them well if we can actually introduce them into the icds into the mdms into the pds we create a huge demand and then we create a positive incentive for our communities to actually do the kind of participatory water management and shift in cropping pattern in line with agroecology that we want so much this country requires otherwise we are you know trillions of liters of water is being exported by india with the rice that we export i mean it's it's just uh, it, it's a kind of a nightmare of uh, uh, wrong structure of incentives which is driving the water crisis in india i will not mention any more your short of time okay. but this is a key policy reform we require if we want to pr promote community action on water yeah why well, we point to note we have to get back to dr shah for uh, your listing he has so much more there right Uh, Professor Chaturvedi, now I turn to you. Now, from the local, national political economy, we go into the international political economy. Well, what it takes to get international agencies to collaborate on effective solutions, and um, when we talk about the south to south shaking hands, uh, can it be actually broad based, and can we actually find some effective partnerships in this? What it takes. as i was mentioning uh, uh, dr shrivasan uh, uh, it's an uh, a very a very appropriate opportunity at this point with us to see how best india can bring in a message through g20 that that i referred to earlier we need to see how some of the already launched initiatives there are two uh, uh, water centric initiatives which saudi arabia launched uh, italian presidency supported and i also alluded to indonesian presidency i think now uh, opportunity has come when india should give a call for uh, the right incentivization that is needed which uh, dr shah was uh, referring to uh, the uh, effort is of course at the state level as he said and even at the district level but the mechanisms for uh, uh, for supporting uh, the larger uh, uh, infrastructure support be that through uh, irrigation projects etc they come from uh, mdbs and uh, uh, the the global financial institutions that disincentivization has to happen like uh, uh, you give calories on 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 your food level please also give uh, the virtual water content uh, and 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 of the exports and uh, many other items in some studies some calculations have been done so as petra was rightly saying uh, we need to bring in the uh, the value of uh, of of water uh, some way so if uh, uh, we are thinking of supporting through uh, the uh, minimum support prices which is happening in case of uh, wheat and rice in india what is it that we can do if we have to go for diversification support those crops how that transition would happen 
in what way the transition would happen. The World Bank uh, has been a party in terms of deepening of the green revolution, all of us know very well. Foundations like Ford Foundation, et cetera, have played an important role in the 60s and 70s. We need to bring back that voluntary action uh, to, to reverse the damage that has been done. And from that perspective, I think a global coalition is required because it is in interest of everyone uh, to, to, to undo what, what has been done. I do not want to get into debate on green revolution, but some damage control is to be done. And, and that uh, has to be reversed. So from that perspective, I think at the global level, a wider understanding is required. The CGIR system has to be recatalyzed in terms of how the transition happens, in what way we see energy prices, because uh, it's not just water. The energy through fertilizers, et cetera, is also linked. So I would very much suggest that we bring forward some of the ground level uh, evidences that we have collected get them uh, uh, sort of represented to our Ministry of Agriculture in the G20, the G20 minister's declaration and the final declaration of the leaders. And we see that the global financial institutions are also sensitized in terms of what direction the money has to go in. Thank you. Uh, thank you, thank Professor Chaturvedi. Actually, I was hoping we will have a another round, but it looks like uh, when I felt I was having a good fortune of talking to three very experienced expert people, the good fortune also doesn't last very long. <laughs> so uh, we are nearing almost, I think the last 10 or 12 minutes of the session and I have to hand over the platform to Vaibhav. Uh, so what I would do is just try and within my limited understanding of such a lot of rich input, just summarize. Uh, basically technology has uh, real-time contribution that it can make to the what do you call participatory approaches in watershed uh, planning and also implementation. On implementation, we have much more uh, longer record of experience in the country. Like Dr. Shah said, there have been quite a number of successes while there have been failures. But the successes prove that it's possible. But as long as the technology EDM is in a form that people recognize and then they are able to adopt, it's possible to bring that into your planning framework and easily translates into um, implementation as well. The, the second important, uh, what do you call, uh, theme that comes through is in participatory water management, we try and provide the ownership of the problem and also the solution therefore. They run operate where charges are involved, they then contribute, they take ownership of maintenance and they see the results. Maybe in a set of 10 watersheds in neighboring villages, you see five of them doing exceedingly well. People have taken total ownership, including maintenance, paying for their, and there might be a few where you might find, then the differences themselves bring forward a momentum in the low performing villages to bring it up. This, this is something we have seen in quite a number of places in Maharashtra, Karnataka. So the, the third, I think, uh, important part that came is, in trying to do this, just do not pass on uh, what we call loosely the capacity building, how to do this, but also invest in creating the why part of it so that they appreciate the value of what they are doing in terms of the natural resources they protect and they conserve for a much longer period of time into the future. And um, yeah, I think across countries, it is possible to achieve a collaboration across communities within the country, it is possible to achieve collaboration. Let us list out what were those features that work in successful participatory watersheds and bring them to all other places. It doesn't matter that these are numerous, uh, located across the country, we could actually do that because as many villages are there, there are as many hundreds of people available to collaborate and do that, it is their problem. So you provide them some ideas on how they could do that. So it, it is something doable as long as we take out the learnings from successful places, maybe make the people who made it successful in the local community go and talk to others in other communities. The way I think um, Mr. Azare was doing that, or our Pani Panchayat people, Mr. Rajinder Singh, you to take a few names. Um, and in terms of how we look at it, in terms of policy, yeah, I think um, Dr. Shah already had shown some of the, what do you call the aspects that are there. It is not that you are looking at water alone as an issue here. The entire ecosystem in which you are making water use happen. Have you looked at that? If you provide perverse incentives for certain types of usage, then you find water use is skewed. 
in favor of thing somebody was jokingly saying you people are not exporting sugar you are actually exporting water which is much more expensive right so there are things like that that come up so can we actually look at policy that relates one, not only to use of water but also the surrounding what promotes much higher use of water without a commensurate pay off and, and things like uh, how do you change the nutrition habit not only the food food habit like uh, one of the example that came to my mind was in uttarakhand the government had a very successful icds program they introduced uh, ramdana amaranthas and uh, madwa into that we found that there was a good spike two year down in the what do you call uh, nutritional status of children not only that farmers were growing these boring crops so so to say they do it now with much more interest because the commercial value of what they produce has gone up it is actually grown with a proper cultivation practice rather than cast and then hope that kind of a cultivation gave rise to something else so the issues relating to policies what are the right incentives what are not and what do you regulate and what do you leave to the wisdom of the local people to actually do maybe the local people have a much better sense of what will work locally and then you don't distract that wisdom with incentives which lead somebody okay i'll grow banana here because there is what's up here um and i think uh, in terms of uh, the countries coming together on this i think professor chaudhary said this time for a global coalition of countries around same set of principles so that uh, whatever we adopt as a policy both technically and economically is not distracted by somebody else doing something else so can we have an even set of policies on which we agree and this is something that has to be scaled up and there are already a few key initiatives taken by other countries when they were in the leadership of g20 g7 all those summit can we follow up on that and go further ahead um, i i think overall the, the issue is um, water and water management they are right in the middle of the theme of agroecology which i think uh, the bm is at the gi is at the, the indian government all of them are not subscribed to. even nabard now has a what you call the jiva project for, significantly follow the agroecological principles so um, water alone does not do magic in watersheds we understand that and say okay let us also bring in a little bit of soil and forest so can we create a positive confluence so that the uh, the so called nature based climate solutions which are thought about um, and their potential for sequestering carbon at a very low effective cost compared to any other method uh, can we make that mainstream and make uh, participatory approaches uh, uh, a key uh, what do you call instrument of uh, delivering good results so i i leave it here and i hope uh, the audience uh, picked up the several Uh, what do you call threads that came through into the discussion i know uh, in 80 minutes you don't do justice to something as large as uh, participatory <laughs> management with the kind of wisdom which was here from the three people who were there it was more than 100 years of solid work on the ground bye bye over to you and uh, thank you all and thank you jay sir fundal it in a manner i mean this is uh, the beauty of water uh it's like a rubik cube or you know so you try to solve more you get into the problem and it is so simple sometimes so once you solve it so you solve it so i think uh, on uh, behalf of uh, indo german cooperation tita sa project uh, nabad and uh, ibni i mean it is uh, a great pleasure for me to say a few words at the end of this conference Special special thanks uh, to Ms. Elizabeth Hicker uh, from BMZ uh, for setting up the context. Dr. Ravi Babu uh, from Nabad uh, on the keynote uh, address and distinguished panelists, uh, Dr. Petra Schmitter, Professor Sachin Chaturvedi, and Dr. Mihesha. I mean, I'm very grateful for having had the opportunity to co-sponsor or co-host this event together with uh, Nabad and Ivni. um with the august gathering here and it has been said earlier on today that this is the first time at least uh, i mean we had joining forces the energy in organizing such a session uh with the multi dimensional aspect so now we are not stopping this session here i mean we are taking this legacy forward this discussion forward in the form of a policy paper or an article so while we are talking there is a group of people who is listening to the all the talks and making it in a very framework 
a way ahead uh, or you can say a policy paper sort of for setting up the pace and direction for Indo-German cooperation with NABARD. And this policy paper will be, uh, the draft will be prepared soon and will be shared with uh, all the panelists uh, and the speakers for their inputs. And uh, subsequently, the, the essence we, which we could be, I mean, we try to get in 80 minutes uh, would at least uh, set up uh, the, you know, some direction and some framework uh, for coming future. So this would be an effort from uh, GIZ side. And again, I would also like to thank all the participants uh, and we would welcome uh, question clarification and suggestion and input on our knowledge products, which is available online open access. Thank you all. Thank you, thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Shah. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Petra. Thank, thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Goodbye.